just let you know too, uh, Mike, I have not done a lot of these, so uh, bear with me as we kind of jump in and, and do this. So you bet. Um, we're going to crush it. Welcome to EarthUp's new and first ever podcast, People, Planet, Profit, It All Starts at Home, where we aim to help businesses and people like you simplify sustainability. EarthUp's CEO, Stephen Bay, will be joined by experts, innovators, and lifelong adventurers to break down some of today's biggest topics affecting the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profits. What does a sick building do to your health? Why should corporations be invested in biodiversity? How can I help create better working conditions and happier employees at my company? We'll cover these questions and so much more in a candid conversation about reshaping the work culture into a landscape that prioritizes people and planet without sacrificing profit. Our next episode starts right now. Thank you for joining Earth Up on our podcast. My name is Stephen Bay, and joining us today is Mike Topitzover from Train Technologies. Mike, how you doing? Hey, Stephen, I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing pretty dang good, Mike. Do you want to kind of jump in and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, you bet. Uh, I'm a Midwestern kid, grew up in Minnesota, and went to the University of Minnesota originally for mechanical engineering. I had a good friend that was in a different degree program called Residential Building Science and Technology at the U of M and was kind of exploring different options. And so I went to a student recruitment event uh, at the U for the Residential Building Science program. I was the only student that showed up. I had three faculty members surrounding me <laughs> um, and it was over from there. It's been building science ever since. That was in 2006. Home building was at an all time high. Job placement was excellent in the building science. And uh, so I, I did that degree, enjoyed it. And when I got out of school, I did weatherization energy audits through the ARA funding, did HERS ratings, uh, you know, worked on new houses, consulting on air sealing and insulation details uh, to make new homes energy efficient. And now at Train Technologies, uh, I've been here for about three years and I work in the residential HVAC and supply business unit. We manufacture heating, ventilation and air conditioning for commercial buildings uh, and, and residential. Crazy, it's been three years, you know, we, uh, since you've been in Tacoma yeah. out in my stomping grounds, a lot of the audience doesn't know what building science is. Do you want to kind of let people know what building science is and, and why it's interesting and why it's important? Yeah, building science is all about the physics of how a house works, the physics of heat, air, and moisture, and how those elements interact with the occupants and the building enclosure and, and how that behavior of heat, air, moisture can affect energy consumption, the building durability, occupant health and wellness, indoor air quality, and applying that knowledge to help prevent building failures. You know, a building failure would be any time a building doesn't last as long as it's designed to last or doesn't provide occupants with a, a healthy and safe space, uses a lot more energy than it was designed for or is not comfortable. Kind of in a nutshell. How air moves through buildings, what's inside the air inside buildings, how to make sure it's healthy, and then how to make sure people who are sitting inside these buildings are comfortable, right? right? I mean, essentially, that's that's your guys's goal at at train is to make sure people are comfortable and healthy in the buildings correct yeah you bet healthy comfortable energy efficient and designed to last a long time what are you seeing on a commercial level when it comes to air quality what they're doing to make sure that it's healthy and comfortable environments for for individuals inside working inside those buildings and living inside those buildings on a commercial level we're building houses tighter than we ever have before building buildings that are better insulated more airtight that's a good thing yeah, you know, we want to have as much separation as we can between the inside and the outside. That's why we build buildings in the first place, right? And right. so if if we've got airtight buildings that are well insulated, there's not as much heat transfer between inside and outside. There's not as much air movement between inside and outside. And so there's a couple impacts of that. Heating systems and air conditioning systems don't need to run as long as they used to in the past in less efficient buildings. 
particularly in the cooling season, if an air conditioner is not running, that air conditioner is also not pulling moisture out of the air. And excess moisture buildup is a problem. We don't want to have buildings that are too humid or you get mold growth, you get discomfort, you know, stuffiness. So that's not a good thing. And then, you know, inside buildings, people are breathing, people are perspiring, and, and you've got CO2 building up fumes and, and particulates from cooking and, and other activities. And in an airtight home, you start to have that buildup of, of air pollutants inside of a house. A couple of problems there. We need ventilation, we need a, a way to mechanically and you know, capable of continuous operation, bringing fresh air into, uh, into buildings and exhausting pollution at the source, right? So we, we know how to do that with bath fans and kitchen fans, but whole house ventilation is, is pretty critical and managing moisture is a, a pretty big deal in airtight homes as well. Something that I've heard, and, and I would wonder if you agree with this, that the building manager actually has more to do with the more impact on your health than your actual doctor does. Would you agree with that? I, I don't well, think it's a, a, an exaggeration to say that your, your building manager can have more of an impact on your health than the doctor. Personally, I've broken six bones and I've had a couple surgeries and so I've, I've, had to be, I've had to spend a lot of time with a doctor and there are buildings out there that can have adverse health effects on occupants. Things that you breathe can lead to chronic illnesses. I have heard of people that have been hospitalized for having mold inside their house. Right. Uh, I've known people personally that uh, have had that happen. So I, yeah. Your, your building can make you sick. Well, and everything you're kind of describing too, I mean, we've, we've both experienced this firsthand where the, the new buildings are built so tight, right? They're really comfortable. They're really efficient in a lot of ways, but essentially they're like a gym bag. You know, when you open that gym bag and you get that mildewy smell and you get that, right, that's something that's happening inside homes, right? And that's why it's important to open windows. That's why it's important to kind of have these, these ventilation things set up. And What's, what was really eye-boning for me going out and doing a lot of these uh, in-home energy assessments was that mm -hmm. it's across the entire socioeconomic spectrum, right? This isn't something that's just impacting low-income communities. This, isn't any, this is something that whether you work, and I've been in homes personally, Google employees, Microsoft employees, Amazon employees, where they have a lot of these issues. And, and we talk about building managers, but when it goes to the home space, who's the building manager? It's the people living in the home. And a lot yep. of these people don't understand some of these concerns. What are some things that you would recommend just quick without knowing specific situations? What are some things that people can do to kind of mitigate some of these issues? Spend more time outside. That's an easy one, right? <laughs> so, I mean, what, what we always hear now, I mean, the kind of the cliche term is we spend 90% of our time indoors. Right. That, I think we had a period here it, for like 14 days, we didn't get above zero. I, I spent a hundred percent of my time indoors uh, yeah. <laughs> during that stretch. And a, a lot of us did up here, making sure you've got a way to get fresh air into your house, uh, run, run bath fans, run your kitchen fan. When you're cooking, use your exhaust fans a, as a way to try to exhaust some not so healthy air and, and draw in fresh outdoor air, change your filters an easy one. We are the building operator, like you described in our own houses. We've got to know how our house works and, and do that operation and maintenance. Talk to a, an insulation contractor, an HVAC contractor that specializes on, on making houses more efficient and more healthy and ask about, you know, what are some ways I can improve the health of my house through air filtration, through ventilation, through a new heating and cooling system, through air sealing or insulating my house, trying to eliminate those, those cold spots or hot spots. That, those are a few that come to mind, Stephen, right away crazy <laughs> that we're spending that amount of time inside but it is good to there's just small things and it's just being aware on, on how you can mitigate these problems and this is something that i found through doing all these energy assessments that almost nobody knows about and it doesn't like i said it doesn't matter where where you are as far as your income and things people just don't understand that these are these are systems that need to be managed right and a lot of times when these systems are created whether it's a commercial building a residential building, they're created at the minimum standard when the house is built. So how the ventilation is set up, how everything is set up, even if you have a house built in 2021, everything and everything that the guidelines that they're going through is to get to that minimum standard. And so what, what our standards and what our codes that we follow, and I think in a commercial building, it's 20 CFM 
per person. But what these standards are, it's like, this is the minimum amount of air that we need to bring in. When you build a house and you set it up to be operating at the minimum level, what happens when you've lived in that house for a year, two years, three years? Now you add somebody who has no experience in managing the system. What are some of the issues that you've seen? I know you've been in a lot of houses. What are some of the issues you've seen firsthand, people not managing their houses correct? You're hitting on so many good topics there, you know, kind of balancing designing for health versus designing for energy efficiency, you know, right. you bring in fresh air. It, it requires heating or cooling that fresh air once it's brought in. So there's they're kind of competing ideals. And I know that this is a big discussion in commercial buildings with reopening, trying to still follow energy efficiency goals and, and reduce energy consumption, yet ventilating enough so that spaces are healthy for people to reoccupy buildings. Can we do that in a way that doesn't really override a lot of energy efficiency gains that, that we're trying to make and, and yet still making buildings healthy? Um, so I, I know that's a big topic in commercial buildings. In residential, just from what I've seen, newer houses in newer codes, starting with, I think it was the 2012 International Energy Conservation Code, first had mandated, you know, all homes need to be built with ventilation capable of continuous operation. Any home built on that 2012 code or more recently should have a ventilation system. A lot of homes do. I have heard of, of builders complaining that the occupant doesn't really understand what that device is. And they unplugged it and, and then they, they get condensation on their windows, uh, you know, maybe build up of odors and they think the windows aren't working. You know, they've, they've got bad windows cause they've got condensation. <laughs> right. And now we've got to try and diagnose why are we having this problem? I don't think it's the window. It's that you unplugged your, your ventilation system. The homeowner is the building operator. You know, healthy, healthy, smart buildings need smart owners. And that's, that's probably where a lot of people aren't helping themselves. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I know I've seen it firsthand where people they are like, this thing blows cold air on me 15 minutes out of every hour, right, which I think is the, the standard right now. So they're like, so I pulled it off the wall, mm -hmm. right? I didn't want it to blow cold air on me. And I've seen it firsthand. And you're like, great. So are you warmer? They're like, yes. Have you seen skin issues? Are you have higher allergies? Are you getting, are you tired more often? And they're like, yeah, actually those things are true. You're like, right. These are so, yeah. this leads me to the next question, which is I'm a father of two, mm -hmm. had a little baby this year. I know you're a dad as well. What are some of the implications that unhealthy buildings, if they're not managed correctly, can really have on children and families in general? Yeah, I, I can think back to doing an energy assessment on a house, walking through the home, I, there was lots of pets, lots of plants in the house. It was a pretty airtight house. Bath fan wasn't working and their attic hatch had mold all over it. And I, I spotted that because this is what I do. I go into houses, I try to look for these problems. And the, the attic hatch in the master bedroom closet covered in, in fuzzy black mold. And I pointed that out to the the parents who were home and there was young kids that lived in this house. And I had said, are you aware that you've got mold here? And I, I think the problem was it was really humid in that house and there was no insulation over the attic hatch. There's a cold surface, which condenses moisture and, and leads to mold growth. And that was pretty eye opening. The mom and the dad kind of looked at each other and they said, see, I told you that's mold. So, I mean, they, they had kind of thought there might be an issue there, but didn't really know what to do except have somebody come out and do an energy assessment and look at their house. And I remember they had said, well, yeah, our, our kids are always sick too. And so boom, right there. I mean, you've got mold in your house. You know that mold can make you sick. It can cause um, a lot of cold and, and flu-like symptoms. And for my own kids, you know, I've, knowing what I know, being in this industry, I do all I can to dial in and control a relative humidity in our house. And we've got MERV 13 filtration. So trying to filter out that small fine dust, control yep. humidity, try and prevent situations that, that might affect our health in a negative way. MERV 13 filters are ones, most filters are designed to stop particulates, right? Little fragments, particulates in the air of about 10 micron size, because mm -hmm. that's what damages heating system. So most filters are there to protect your heating system, making sure your heating system operates. When you talk about smaller size particulates, they don't affect the heating system, but a lot of us are breathing them in and they can get into our lungs and our bloodstream. MERV 13 filters, I'm pretty sure block PM 2.5 or greater. Um, that's what you get if you have, like, if you're in San Francisco or in Seattle, like we are, and you get all those fires in the summer times, that's 
that's PM 2.5 that you're getting those air quality readings. So I know you're working from home now. I'm working from home now. And there's a lot of companies that have said that their employees are going to be working from home at least multiple days a week through the end of forever, <laughs> right? So this is something that's going to be ongoing. Working from home is great. And there are a lot of benefits for both the employees and employers. But just like everything, doing it without a strategy can create a lot of issues. So from a business standpoint, I keep using the quote, what gets measured gets managed. If you're an organization and you have no idea, I mean, you you historically are looking at these buildings, you have building operators, you're looking at all these things, you're making sure there's the right amount of air, and now you're pushing everybody into the home, you're probably not going to see too many negative effects after year one. But what are some of the business implications that you think are going to come from people working from their home, working from their basement? Um, now they're stuck inside indoors, not just in, indoors, but indoors in the same area over and over, eat, sleep, work um, constantly. What do you think some of the business implications are? I, I like that term, what gets measured gets managed. Yeah. Uh, I've used a similar term a lot. Things that are measured tend to improve. So yeah. kind, of, kind of the same thing there. I, so I go back to the beginning of this pandemic. I remember reading a lot of helpful stuff, transitioning to this work from home life, you know, little tips to maintain productivity, how to manage distractions, even like cybersecurity. A lot of helpful tips like that. And there's a lot of studies that talk about how temperature and air quality can affect test scores in kids in school. Mm -hmm. um, I think the same thing applies to adults at work. So maybe there's opportunity, kind of like with the, the you know, productivity tips and cybersecurity type stuff, advice or tips that can go out to people working from home, you know, how to how to protect your health at home, you know, how to control temperature, kind of set up a little microclimate at home where you're comfortable or you can be productive or you can eliminate noise, uh, things like that. That may be a nice opportunity, but I think it's a good discussion to have. You're trying to give uh, corporations some tools to empower their employees to, uh, to have a healthy workspace. I think patience is, is a huge thing working from home with little kids, right? And also, you know, us adults, you know, whoever is working, we tend to go wherever we can to get away from that so that we can try to focus, right? I can see that you're in your basement. It's probably more comfortable at your kitchen table, but it's hard to probably be productive up there, right? So it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's the other thing is there's just not a lot of ideal working situations. Don't get me wrong. I love the ability to work from home. I think there's a ton of benefits from working from home. Like we said, what gets measured gets managed. So we have, we have to make sure we're understanding ways to improve and drive productive work environments. Even if your employees are in a basement or in an attic or, you know, hiding behind the kitchen counter so your kids don't pull on your hair as, as you're trying to jump into a Zoom call. So one of the things that I strongly believe, Mike, is that companies now that they're saying employees get to work from home, you know, they're, they're not accounting for a number of things. Personally, I'm, I'm really on the environmental side, the emissions, right? You see, saw in the pandemic, a lot of companies reported a reduction in emissions, specifically in scope one and scope two emissions, which is energy sources. But they really just kind of took it off their balance sheet and moved it over to employees' balance sheet because employees' homes aren't 100% clean. They're just no longer reporting on some of that energy. And so one of the things that I wanted to kind of hear from you is as companies are really trying to reduce their environmental impact, which is, you know, becoming more and more prevalent and trying to improve employees work from home spaces, where do you think that line lies? You know, if you were running a company, if you're an executive with all the building science knowledge that you have, what would you be trying to do to, to make sure that employees are one, being productive, but also being able to understand and, and reduce their environmental impact? That's a really good question. I think you mentioned ESG. I, a lot of companies have pretty good goals related right. to their own carbon footprint and offsetting carbon emissions and production facilities at, at their real estate. And now a lot of workforce is at home. I think that's a really relevant discussion. You know, an example that I can think of the city that I live in subsidized energy ratings or energy audits through our local utility. And I took advantage of that about 10 years ago where, you know, somebody came out at no, no expense to me, took a look at the attic insulation, you know, furnace efficiency, things like that, and wrote a, a report recommended, here's your top three things that you can do to improve energy efficiency. And here are some incentives through our, our utility program that you could take advantage of if you decide to act on any of those. So that's a model that could be followed um, if, if corporations have a 
some goals that include carbon emissions and if they extend that to people's houses. You talked on rebates, and I know that there's so many different rebates available, whether it's a smart thermostat, whether it's a home energy assessment, whether they're buying a new furnace or heat pump or upgrading attic insulation, upgrading windows. But a lot of people just don't even know these things exist, right? So creating awareness around those. So if you're an organization, you know, you think that at least try to educate your employees on what are some incentives out there. Yeah. So that they can focus on these things. So being able to just say, hey, there's some incentives. Earth Up, for example, in our prototype, we launched with a couple Fortune 500 companies, and the average employee qualified for over $1,700 worth of rebates through their local utility. And that's not including federal incentives, it's not including city incentives. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all those different things, and those things are starting to build up more and more. But I think that's a great point yeah. just being able to know what existing incentives are out there, what resources are available that you can, that employers can help kind of connect their employees to is a good first place to start. It's just like, hey, like take a look at this. Let's create some awareness around these things because then it reduces the barrier to adoption. Yeah, and it reduced the barrier, plant, plant a seed, you know, plant that idea. That could go a long way. Houses are pretty personal things, right? It's a personal asset if you own your home. I don't necessarily love the idea of someone telling me what to do with my house. And yet, you know, you, I don't know if you can force anyone to do anything, but giving those ideas and we're also pumping tons of money into the economy. So I think there's a lot there. One of the things that, that companies are talking about a lot now is the triple bottom line, right? People, planet, profit. And something I like to say is people, planet, profit, it all really starts at the home. So if you actually are educating people on these different technologies, these different rebates that are available, they start moving forward and creating healthier, more comfortable environments. Mm -hmm. They're creating jobs. They're creating healthier communities, right? You're reducing sick days. All these different things start yeah. to really spiral. And on top of all of that, you're reducing the environmental impact. Mm -hmm. I know you said building health and energy efficiency, which energy efficiency kind of goes hand in hand with your emissions. They're kind of in competition in some senses, but in a lot of senses, they're on the same page too, right? I mean, if you create a well-insulated, well-air-sealed home and you ventilate it correctly, you're more energy efficient, you're more comfortable, and you're healthier. What are the motivators? Is it comfort? Is it health? Is it reducing their environmental impact? And what, if you could prioritize the top three things that motivates buyers um, for upgrading these things, what would they be? I think healthy homes are the new energy efficiency, right? Energy efficiency was really big 10 years ago when oil was, you know, over a hundred dollars a barrel. I think now there's a lot more awareness about indoor air quality. So creating a healthy space at home is, is number one, you know, creating a, a comfortable space, probably second followed by, you know, reduced spending on, on monthly energy bills personal climate footprint is is important to a lot of people limiting their their impact on the environment for sure so mike we're going to get to the the quick hitter section of the the podcast one sentence or less try to answer this question you ready you for bet. this you bet yeah what gets you up in the morning go try and make the world a better place what's uh what what do you drink for breakfast every morning about three cups of black coffee <laughs> is there any books that you would recommend on energy efficiency or indoor air quality? There's a book I'd recommend called Residential Energy Efficiency by John Krieger and, uh, and Dorsey, Krieger and Dorsey. Is there any new technology that you are excited about? Yeah, um, there's two things that I'm going to mention here. Energy recovery ventilators are going to be really, really common. Uh, they're already common in some places. And advanced air filtration, MERV 13 or better. Mike, thank you very much for joining us today. It was great. We're going to have to have you back on here to continue the conversation. Keep doing what you're doing. We really appreciate it. And, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me, Stephen. Uh, enjoyed the conversation. Take care. And that's our episode, folks. If you'd like more info about what Mike is up to at Train Technologies, visit traintechnologies.com. That's train, T-R-A-N-E, technologies.com. Thank you for listening in and for your support. If you like this show, hit that subscribe button, tell a friend, share with a colleague, and rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Your support helps us reach a wider audience, so thank you. To learn more about EarthUp and our journey to launching our new platform that's helping companies and communities simplify
identify sustainability, visit earthup.eco and follow EarthUp on LinkedIn.